Okay, let's get started. So, you've done some soul searching, you've looked into the very bottom of your soul and your depths of your being, and you have concluded that you are an absolutely cynical, insecure, ruthless SOB who absolutely should be starting a business of their own as opposed to working for somebody else. You have looked at all the people in your life that you have ever known. You've identified those who would be target customers of yours. You have identified their fears and their passions, which is what motivates them to buy things. And you have a strategy for selling your products and services to those people. You then have looked at the four different types of competitors, and you have developed absolutely compelling strategies to wipe those poor sick bastards off the face of the planet. Uh, you then have looked at the people around you and who you might want to hire as uh, partners or uh, as advisors and you have your management team completely set up. Well, believe it or not, there's only one more thing you have to do before you're done planning and you're ready now to start your business, and that is to ask one last question, but a very compelling question, which is, will this thing make money? You know, that's why you're doing this. You're not doing this to have fun. You are doing this to make some money, either a little bit of money as a part-time thing or as a new second career or maybe a third or a fourth or a fifth career. You want to make money at this thing. Will this business make money? I see a lot of business plans in my, in my life that get all the way down to this question and the plan falls apart at this point. There are a lot of things out there that have customers. You can deal with the competitors. Um, you can easily find the people that you need to, for your management team but the bloody thing just can't make money. I mean, I, I will give you a very compelling example of that. Uh, we live in a very high income area where, where we live here and where I'm shooting this video, okay? One of the problems that I have working with small businesses in this area is that I have trouble finding good small business bookkeepers to help them. I have trouble finding bookkeepers who will work with startup small businesses. Now, some of you here I know have an accounting background, so you're looking at me and saying, hey, wait a minute, whoa, Cliff gave me a good idea here. You know, he needs small business bookkeepers. I know how to do that. Hey, I'm gonna be a bookkeeper. I'll work for small businesses. Cliff probably has a few clients he can give me right now. Okay, no question, the customers are there. I can help you find people. I know five, 10 people right now that are looking for, small, for help with, uh, with their bookkeeping to get a small business off the ground. I can get you business. There isn't a whole lot of competition either, right? I told you, I'm having trouble finding these people, right? You know, it's a business you can do yourself. You don't need partners. You don't need a you know, technical big board of advisors, although I still suggest you have a couple, right? So what's the issue here? Why is it that so few people are doing bookkeeping you know, in this area? Well, let me ask a question. If you were looking to hire a bookkeeper, how much would you pay that person? Would you be willing to pay that person $200 an hour? How about 100? How about 50? How about 20? 20 is starting to sound about right now. I'm starting to see a couple people shake their heads. In this area, the average going rate for bookkeepers is 20 to $30 an hour. How many of you here can live on 20, $30 an hour? This is why there are so few small business bookkeepers here in the area where we live. It's a great business plan, except that you can't make money at it. People will not pay you what you need to make in order to make a decent living. That's a classic example of that, okay? So what we're gonna learn about tonight is financial management, basically. I hate to use those words because it scares people off. You think we're gonna be talking about a lot of numbers and equations and stuff like that, and that's not how I roll. Um, I talk about the real world and how people that I work with actually do this stuff. What we're gonna be learning about tonight is where does money come from? Number one, doesn't grow on trees, right? We know that. Where do you, where do you find the money you know, that you need to grow your business, number one? Two, how do you do the financial planning for a startup business? How do you plan your cash flow, your cash flow projections, your operating budget? We're gonna talk about that tonight. And then last but not least, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to price your product and service, because that's one of the big questions that you have when you're starting off a business. How should I price myself? Especially if I'm doing some kind of a weird service, there isn't a lot of it being done in this area. You know, How do I price myself competitively in that situation? Those are the topics that we're gonna be talking about tonight. So without any further ado, let's get started. Where does money come from? Well, believe it or not, the whole books have been written on this topic, and I, I really wanna make it simple for you. I, I really do. Um, you know, I'm not gonna talk a lot about angels and venture capital and SBA loans and all the stuff that you usually talk about, uh, because quite frankly, none of you here in this room are ready for that yet. You're just getting started. You're just, most of you here are just getting, some of you are at the idea or concept stage, some of you aren't even there, um, but most of you are just getting off the ground. And for a startup business, it's very simple. 
There are two places and only two where money comes from for a startup small business, a business that's just getting off the ground. Uh, here's how I like to illustrate this. Here is your business, that's the square, and money comes from two different places. It comes from your customers, the people you sell to, your clients, in the, and the money that comes from these people we call revenue, or gross revenue, sometimes net revenue, we'll talk about the difference later, um, okay, from your customers, people who pay you for your services, and that is considered revenue, okay? The second place that money comes from is from the owners of the business. That means you, that means your partners, the people who are sharing in the, in the profits and losses of the business. That means any money that you have borrowed uh, on your credit cards, because those are in your name, not in your business name. Any money that you may have gotten from a second, third, fourth, or fifth mortgage loan would come in here. Any money that you borrowed from Uncle Ernie in the form of a private loan for so, so much money. Any money that is being made to you and then you are putting it into the business in the, we, is, all, is, is all included in all of this. The money that owners put into the business is referred to as capital. Revenue and capital. These are the only two places that money comes from for a startup small business. Once you get a little bit bigger, then there are more places you can get money from. You can get a, take out an SBA loan or a, a micro loan, a working capital loan, which the SBA offers. Uh, you can do an angel, uh, get money from an angel. You can get money from venture capitalists. All of that is down the road. When you're first starting out though, these are the only two places where money comes from. I work with a lot of investors and they all say the same thing to me. They say, Cliff, we're perfectly happy to invest in a company that's growing, that's expanding, that needs our money to get from level one to level two, but first they've gotta to get to level one. If they're looking for money to pay their light bill or their utility bills, I'm not interested in that, quite frankly. I, you know, I, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be funding that kind of stuff. They should be generating enough revenue to cover those kinds of expenses. Uh, I don't really want to be, be involved in that initial stage. If, I talk to, if I'm talking to a business that hasn't gotten to that stage yet, my, my answer, although I'll probably say it a lot nicer than this, is come back when you grow up, okay? Now, these are the only two places that money comes from for a startup business, and there's kind of a trade-off between them. Because each month, or each quarter, sometimes each week, the business has expenses to pay, okay? Uh, and there are different kinds of expenses. There are fixed expenses. So for example, if you have a retail business, there's your rent, um, you know, there's the electric bill that comes every month. There are also variable costs, such as your payroll. You know, you hire more people when you're busy, you lay off people when you're not so busy. That's why it's called a variable cost. All of these things have to be paid every month. Okay, if your customers are not paying you enough money in the form of revenue to pay those expenses each month, well, who has to handle, the, who, who has to cover the shortfall? Answer, these people, okay? When there are only two ways to make money for a business, there's a trade-off between the two. The lower this amount is, the more these people have to cough up to keep the business on life support, okay? Um, so, when you start out, of course, and that's why I say that, uh, and, I, and, I, and I often give this exercise in this class, one of the first things you should do when you start thinking about money for your business is to make a list of all the things that you have to spend money on before you can even open your doors and take in your first dollar of revenue. Why is that important? Why do you want to spend so much time thinking about those things? Because look at the chart, by definition, you don't have customers yet. You haven't opened your doors yet. You haven't had your grand opening. You haven't gotten any money, okay? So who has to pay all of the expenses that you're gonna incur while you're building your business at this stage? Answer, the owners will. It's really very simple. When, you're, when you haven't opened your doors yet, when you haven't taken in your first customer, or your first client, these people have to fund 100% of all the operating expenses of the business at that point in time. That is why the first thing you should do when you're thinking about starting a small business and you're thinking about the money and the financial side of things, make a list of all those expenses that you're gonna need to incur before you can even open your doors and take in your first dollar worth of revenue. 
And then once you've done that, ask yourself the second question, can I afford this? Can I afford to keep this business on life support during this period of time? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, well, what that means is you need to bring on a financial partner. You need to bring in somebody as a partner who has the money that will help you pay for the startup expenses of the business until such time as there's enough revenue from the coming in from the customers to pay those. Okay, so now let's talk about this a little bit. Eventually, so, so let's say you start a business today, you run it for several months, money starts to trickle in, and eventually you get to a point in time where the revenue that's coming in from your customers each month is enough to pay the operating expenses of the business for that month. Hip, hip, hooray. This is a major moment in the life of any small business. We have a name for it. We call it the break-even point is what we call it. I mean, there, there, some people have written whole books about this and they give all kinds of complicated formulas for breaking even and, and, and break even analysis as they call it, but it really is a very simple concept. Break, e, break even is simply a point in time in which the revenues coming in from the customers are sufficient to cover the monthly operating expenses of the business without these people having to put in any money to keep the business on life support. Break even is a very important concept. One of the very first questions and an investor will ask you if you're starting a small business is what is your time to break even how long will it take you to get to this point because remember I said before these investors don't want to be funding you at that time they want to wait till a point after you have broken even before they start considering about investing they can help you find money to grow your business but they can't help you find money to survive during that critical first months where the revenue coming in isn't enough to pay the operating expenses of the business it's a very important concept for the average small business the time to break even should be somewhere between six and eighteen months in general, depending on the nature of the business. Uh, for a basic service business, say a cleaning service, where you can start getting money from day one or maybe a solo law firm, you know, the prime to prime to break even should be two to three months. For a manufacturing business, for a business where there's going to be more of a long ramp up time, let's say for example you're developing a software product, for example, where you have to research it, develop it, patent it maybe, or copyright it, you know, then you're looking at a much longer time to break even. You're probably looking at a 12 to 24 month period. But anything beyond 24 months I think is going to be a problem unless you are incredibly wealthy uh, and you can afford it how many of you here would feel comfortable hitting up your credit cards 60 months in a row five years to start a business of your own and pay all the monthly expenses on that credit card for 60 months I'm not seeing a whole lot of hands here okay well don't feel bad this is exactly how your investor is looking at it as well you know, very few people will be willing to, the longer it takes you to break even, the more frightened these people are going to get. Sooner or later, these people are going to lose heart. Hey, Cliff, it's been 36 months now. We're still hitting up our credit cards to keep this business on life support. Man, what's happening? When are you going to, when is this thing going to take off? When are you going to break even here so that you don't have to call us every month asking for more money? You know, they're going to start asking questions like that. And even if it's you, even if you don't have partners, sooner or later, you're going to get tired of doing this as well. You're going to see that credit card balance going up and up and up and up. And at some point, you're going to say, hey, no more. I'm just not doing this anymore. I'm cutting my losses now. I got I to gotta pay that sucker off. I need a second job just to pay off my credit card. You're human too, okay? The longer it takes for break even to happen, the more frightened these people are going to be. Conversely, on the other hand, the sooner this happens, the sooner you can break even, two very wonderful things start to happen. Number one, these people start breathing a lot easier. <sighs> okay, he did it. We were a little worried there for a while, but Cliff's breaking even now, we're not worried anymore. He's not hitting us up for money every month. That's the first good thing. The second good thing is, if you really break even fast, really fast, other people will want to come in and be owners and make capital contributions to your company now because they see success. Selling investors is really very easy. I, I often tell my, my clients, it's a matter of verb tense. The tense of the verb that you use when you're selling and pitching your company to them. Very few people will invest in something that is going to happen someday, but many, many people, including maybe you, some of you in this room, would invest in something that is happening right now. 
If I can persuade you that I've got a bottle rocket that is leaving the launching pad right now, and it's only a question of whether it's your money on board or somebody else's, you will start digging into your wallet because you want to be part of the next Facebook, the next Twitter, the next Snapchat, the next whatever. Okay, but if I keep saying about, if I keep talking about, well, now this may happen, uh, if we do this and if X, Y, and Z falls into place, then this business will do, your eyes are going to start glazing over at some point saying, you know what, this thing is too far in the future. I'm not so sure that I want to put my money in right now. Let's wait until this is a little further down the road and is closer to happening, and then I'll, I'll consider putting some of my money in. Uh, the verb tense that you use is very, very important when you're trying to sell investors. You really want to, and the best way to do that is to show a very, very, very short time to break even, okay? So this is lesson number one. Money only comes, at least in the beginning. When you get bigger, there's definitely more places you can get money, but in the beginning, everything comes from these two people, okay? It come, either comes from the customers or the owners. The longer it takes the customers to, to support the business, the more nervous these people are gonna get until finally they get to a point where they just don't wanna do it anymore. The sooner you can get to break even, the better everybody feels and the, more, and the greater the likelihood that you will get money from additional people. People, what's the famous old Chinese saying? Success has a thousand fathers, failure is an orphan. Okay, by showing a short time to break even, you're showing investors and other two people too that you are going to be successful. So, that's lesson number one, where does money come from? Okay. So now, how do you do your financial planning for a startup business? This is tough. For an established business, financial planning is very easy. Why? Because we have money coming in every month. We have revenue coming in every month. We know what our expenses are. We can budget, we can plan. But how do we do that for a startup business where we don't know a lot of the stuff? We don't really know what a lot of the numbers are going to be. Okay, how do we do it? Well, here's how most of my clients do it. And here's, and, you know, maybe it, it follows a textbook and maybe it doesn't. Um, but it's the way that, mo that most people starting a business do it. And it's not rocket science. You do not have to be a math wizard to, pl to plan financially for a startup business. There are a number of steps. The first step is to know your costs and know them cold. No one has any idea what your sales are going to be like in month one, month three, month five, month seven. You can take some guess, some educated guesses, but that's the best you can do. But you do know what your costs are going to be. You can plan them. Um, if you're using a bookkeeper, uh, for example, they will have sample, what they call charts of account for various types of small businesses. So for example, if you are a solo lawyer and you're hiring a bookkeeper, you can ask him, could you show me some charts of accounts for some of your other solo law firm clients? Well, of course, the numbers and names taken out. You, you know, he's not gonna disclose confidential information of another client, but you can certainly ask him to show you, and there will be a list of all the expenses that a typical solo law firm has. The rent, the payroll, the computers, all that stuff. It'll all be spelled out for you. All you gotta do is plug in the numbers. You know, but if you're, and, and there are books too online that can help you with sample charts of accounts. So for example, if you're starting an antiques business, for example, uh, the people who publish Entrepreneur Magazine have some excellent books on how to set up an antiques business and they give you different charts of account uh, for that, for that, for those, for those types of business. You can find this information online or by paying a few bucks. You can get template charts of accounts, but the best one, the chart of accounts is the one that you do yourself. And a chart of accounts is very simple. It's simply a listing of all the costs that you're going to incur and when you're going to incur them. It's a spreadsheet. What you do is you take a spreadsheet, you start with the current year, so uh, you know, January you know, 2000, whatever, February, March, April, May. You put 12 months in, I suggest 18 months if you can do it. And then for each of the categories, you plug in how much you're gonna to have to spend each of those months for the next 12 to 18 months. So if you know that your rent is gonna be approximately $2,500 a month for your retail space or your office space, you put $2,500 in each of the rent boxes for the next 18 months. Okay, simple enough, right? And you do this for all of your costs. Here is an area where your ruthlessness is very important. Uh, it's very easy to underestimate cost when you're starting a small business. It's very easy to do. One of the, you're gonna have to look for costs, even things that you haven't even considered. That's why I suggest looking at some sample charts of accounts, because it will suggest costs to you that you don't know about. So for example, your rent, your payroll, your computer, all that, that stuff you'll probably think about. But what about insurance? 
What about the cost of legal fees? If you want to form an LLC, you're going to have to pay a lawyer, an accountant, or somebody, LegalZoom or somebody like that, to do it, right? You, people forget to put that cost in. Professional services is one of the most overlooked startup costs. You should always have a, a line item for that stuff. You know, people overlook costs. You gotta be ruthless. Think of costs, even if you don't think you're gonna be spending money on it for a while, make it a line item. And just put a number in there and, and just and play with it and see what happens. This is all you're doing now. You're plotting your costs over the next 12 to 18 months. That's the first step in putting together uh, the, the necessary financial statements for a startup business, right, okay? Um, now, there's two things when you're, do, when you're doing this, when you're plotting your costs for the future, two little pieces of advice. Do you include your time? Do you build in a salary for yourself? This is a big question. Some people do, some people don't. I have clients who say, well, for the first six months, I'm not gonna put in any salary for myself because I know I'm, not gonna, I'm just gonna be making enough money to pay the rent every month, probably. I don't think I'm gonna have enough left over for that. I have other clients who say, I want to be earning money from the business from day one. I want to live off the business. Have you ever heard the, somebody say that they're living off the business? That's really what they mean. Your time is a cost. It's, it's, not, it's not something that you always get paid for. But you know, to start a small business, you're gonna be putting in a lot of hours. You should at least, as a cost, be putting in a number for, I think you should, for your time that you're gonna be spending here. It can be minimum wage. Um, the best way to do it is to find out what people would pay you to do the same job if you were doing it for somebody else. So for example, uh, if you're starting up a restaurant, for example, and you're gonna be the primary cook, the primary chef, find out what chefs at similar restaurants are making and plug that number in as, uh, as, as the number for your time. So if the average you know, fast food chef in your town is making $40 an hour, that's what you plug in. You're not gonna get it, chances are, especially in the first few months you're not gonna get it, but it's a good idea to keep track of your time, how much you're spending, and especially how much money you're foregoing by not working for someone else. If after 18 months you haven't, you haven't started paying yourself a little something, you're probably in the wrong business, I hate to say it. You should be making at least a little bit over your basic expenses so that you can pay yourself a little something after 12, 18 months. If that's not happening, you probably should be working, you're probably better off working for somebody else and getting paid you know, on a W-2, on a payroll. You're probably better off. So I tend to think you should put your time in. Some people don't, especially for the first few months because they know that you know, the revenue's not gonna be there. But get into the habit of paying yourself and putting things on the books that eventually, that money that will eventually get into your pocket. So that's the first thing you need to do. That's the first thing, um, the first thing you need to know about uh, the costs. Then the second thing, okay, when you have your chart of accounts together, when you have all your, your costs projected over the next 12 to 18 months, go down each of the line items and increase them 20 to 25%. Just go into each of the boxes, Excel, if you're using Excel, there's a function where they can do it automatically, so you don't have to do it for each box. It will automatically increase all the rows, all the columns by 20, 25%. Take advantage of that feature. Always overestimate your costs a little bit. Always overestimate your costs a little bit. Uh, that's very important. You will find hidden costs. In every business, you will find costs that you didn't know about, surprise costs, Sometimes you'll have to put a new line item in. Sometimes you realize the number in your line item was just too small. You will always find, most of my clients find, that their, co their actual costs exceed their estimates by a small amount of money. Build in a fudge factor here. Increase your costs by 20 to 25 percent. Now, some of you are looking at me and saying, well, wait a minute, I thought the idea is to keep costs as low as possible. You're absolutely right. But when you're planning for the future, it's a little bit better to err on the side of, of budgeting too much than budgeting too little, okay? What you are doing here, by the way, what I'm teaching you how to do here, we have a technical name for it. We call it a cash flow projection. Okay, that's the technical name for it, a cash flow projection. But really, the more informal name is an operating budget. What you are doing is you are budgeting the operation of your business for the future. Think of it like that. You probably do a household budget, right? Where you plan your expenses for the next month and how much money you're gonna get. And if you're gonna have any surprise expenses, you try to figure out a way to deal with that. 
Well, that's all you're doing here, folks. I mean, you can call it a fancy name if you want to, but all you're doing here is you're really budgeting and trying to predict what your time to break even is. That's what you're trying to do. The first step, identify your costs, be ruthless. Put in, try to find every single cost that you're gonna pay, but then build in a fudge factor because you're always gonna be slightly wrong. You're always gonna underestimate slightly. Everybody overlooks certain expenses. Okay? When I first started out practicing law, I had budgeted a number for malpractice insurance, but I did not budget anything for disability insurance. Those of you who remember my lecture uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous part, you know, my insurance agent talked me into buying that disability coverage, and thank goodness I had it. Uh, but that was a number I had to add to my, my chart of accounts when I was, uh, when I was doing, when I, when, I, when, I, when I bought the coverage. I had to add that amount, you know, the semi-annual uh, premium that you pay twice a year. I had to do that. Okay, so step number one is looking at your costs. Step number two now, now we have to look at the revenue side of this spreadsheet. So now we have a spreadsheet, we've listed 150 costs, we got numbers in there, we know pretty much exactly what our monthly operating expenses for the business are going to be. So now we gotta figure out how much revenue are we gonna be getting that will cover these expenses, okay? Now, how do you do it scientifically? The answer is, there's no way. There's no way. There is no way to project revenue for a startup small business. I can say that with absolute confidence. I mean, if you have an established business that has an, a, a number of years in, of history, of operating history behind it, there are some statistical calculations you can do to predict revenue going forward, but for a startup small business, it is absolutely impossible to do with 100% accuracy. Uh, it's as much an art as it is a science. Basically, what you do is you have to do some educated guessing. So now that we've projected our costs, we need to project revenue. Now, first we have to define revenue and gross revenue for those of you who have an accounting background. And it's really a very simple definition. Your revenue is the number of things you sell multiplied by the price per unit. So if you are a bookstore and you sell 10 books and your first day at $12 a book, your revenue is $120, 10 times 12. That's it, that's as hard as the math gets in this entire program. Okay, everybody with me on that? So that's your revenue. If I am a lawyer and I do three LLCs for people at $500 an LLC, my monthly revenue is $1,500, 500 times three. Simple, it's very simple math, okay? And this is very important, by the way, um, because when we talk a little bit later about growing a business, okay, um, we're gonna see that there's really only a, a number of limited ways you can do that. So keep this definition in mind, it's gonna be becoming very important. Basically what you're gonna do here is you look at your monthly costs, and then what you do is for each of the months, you basically calculate at different price levels and different numbers of units, how much money you will make each month. So for example, um, you know, if, if your goal is to, if your monthly operating expenses are $150, okay, and you're thinking of pricing your product or service at $50, well then that means that you've gotta sell, you have to have three sales a month at least to cover your basic expenses. Is everybody with me on that? Basically what you do, once you know what your costs are, you know how much you need to cover them each month, so now what you gotta do is plug in different, no, different quantities and different prices and get to a point where you feel comfortable, yes, this will actually happen, okay? So for example, if I'm starting up a solo law firm and I realize that in order to cover my expenses during the first couple of months, I have to, I have to basically form 100 LLCs a month to cover my basic operating expenses, how likely do you think that's going to be? Probably not gonna happen, at least not in the first few months, right? Maybe when I'm 20 years out, I might be able to do 100 LLCs a month, but in the very beginning, I'll be exhausted. I'll grow, I'll be old before my time if I have to do that. Two or three LLCs a month is a, probably a reasonable forecast. 100 LLCs is not a very reasonable forecast. Most people who do this exercise do th uh, three different scenarios. They do a, a worst case scenario where you know, they're only doing one or two sales a month at different price levels. 
Um, then they do a best case scenario where, you know, success beyond our wildest dreams, you know, how many sales would we have a month? And then in the middle, once they do those, they do an, what they call an optimum forecast, which is here's what we think is actually gonna happen. You know, given the market, given the competition, given all the things I think, I think it's reasonable to say that in month three, month four, we should be able to make four sales a month, and here's what the results would be at different price levels. You begin by projecting the number of sales, because that you have a pretty good idea of. How many sales can you expect to have in a month? And then you plug in different price levels and to figure out at what point do, does this happen? At one point does break even happen? In the first couple of months, your revenue is probably not gonna cover your expenses, but sooner or later, after six months, maybe nine, maybe 12, that break even point will happen. And what you wanna be able to do is to figure out at different sales levels and at different prices, how do those things affect break even? What we're talking about here is doing a cash flow projection. Just to recap for a second, when you're doing a cash flow projection, what you're trying to figure out is when will break even happen? When will the revenue from your customers be enough each month to cover your basic operating expenses? The first thing you do is you plot your expenses. You do it on a chart or a spreadsheet over the next 12 to 18 months. Think about putting in a number for your time, although if you don't do it, that's okay. And then at the very end of the process, when you really think that you've, you've nailed all your costs, add another 20 to 25% to them. Build in a fudge factor, because you're gonna find that you probably, in nine times cases out of 10, you will need that fudge factor to be accurate. Then you project your revenue. What you do is you figure out how many sales do you think you're going to have of different products, different services in a given month, and then you plug in different prices against those number of sales. Revenue is simply the product of uh, the number of things you sell each month multiplied by the price per thing, that's all it is. So once you have a sense of how many sales you're gonna have every month, and by plugging in different prices, you, you basically uh, know what your, or at least you have a pretty good guess of what your operating revenue is gonna be uh, each month. Do a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and an optimum scenario in between, which is the one that probably will be closest to reality. Now, when we're thinking about pricing, okay, I told you I was gonna talk about how do you price your products and services? I mean, how do you do it? I mean, right now, I'm just suggesting that you plug in different prices, that's all, and see what happens to the numbers at different price levels. So for example, by increasing your prices by $10, you might actually take a month off your time to break even. You'll break even quicker by raising your prices. Or maybe by, by adding you know, another number to your sales. Yeah, two sales a month's not enough. Let's try for three at the same price. That may also get the time to break even much shorter. You want the time to break even to be as short as possible. Uh, that, that just goes back to number one, okay? So when we're, when we're plugging in numbers on prices though, I mean, how do we do it? I mean, how do we know how to price our stuff, okay? Um, that takes a little bit of imagination, but, but not very much. Um, but there are two things that you need to know. So, but, but, but there are a couple of things you need to know, and I'm gonna talk about them in a minute, but first of all, I wanna finish the, the cash flow projection. So let's say, for example, now you do this exercise, and even, and when you finish it, even at your best case scenario, the, the, the best situation that could possibly happen, you know, one sale a month, or you know, tw the lowest price that you can possibly charge, you're still taking 12 to 18 months to break even. The costs are simply too big, okay? Well, then there's, there's two ways you can handle that, obviously. You can either increase your revenue, you, it, it means you're not charging enough, or lower your costs, it means your costs are too high. Now, of course, you built in this fudge factor, so they may very well be a little bit too high, but you don't wanna cut the fudge factor. What you really wanna do at that point is to look at all your costs on this chart and say, you know what, am I spending too much on A, B, and C? Am I, am I manufacturing this product in the United States? Okay, can I save money by manufacturing in China? If I'm making this one part out of uh, steel, can I save money by making it out of aluminum? Well, there really are only two ways that you can grow a business. Uh, you know, basically, when you have a business, it's very simple. You live on the gap between revenue and costs. So when your numbers don't work out, or when they show that you're gonna take forever to get to break even point, there's only two ways that you can deal with that situation. Either the, the prices that you're charging are too low, 
the, um, uh, you're not selling enough, you need to be more aggressive and increase your sales, or your costs are too high. Those are the only three problems that you can have. It's actually three problems, not two, okay? I'll say that again. If your revenue projections are showing that it's gonna take you too long to get to break even, there's only three ways you can fix that problem. Either raise your prices more, sell more product, you know, be more aggressive, increase the number of sales, or lower your costs, okay? Let's talk about these two things for the moment. Can we, can we raise our prices to infinity? You know, if you came to me to form an LLC and I quoted you $15,000 to form an LLC, what would you do? You'd go running out of the office. No way you could afford that, right? So what does that tell you? It means that, that you can't raise your prices forever. There's a ceiling out there beyond which you cannot raise your prices. And the ceiling that is out there, we call competition. When plotting your prices, when, when projecting revenue and plotting your prices, you need to be mindful of where your competition is. If you're a solo lawyer doing wills, and every lawyer in Fairfield County or, or where we are, charges $600 for a will, well, you'll make a lot of money at 500, but you're not gonna make any money at seven or 800. Simple enough, right? You gotta know where your competition is. You know, if, if the only way that you can break even is to charge more than your competition, that is probably not gonna work out as a strategy uh, very well. Although there is one exception to that, I, I will tell you that. Uh, there is something we call a value-added product or a value-added service, where you can charge more than your competition and get away with it, okay? Basically, most of you here do not have a value-added product or a value-added service, but some people do. Uh, and the best way that I can illustrate this is, if you want an interior designer to, you know, uh, to, to replan your bedroom or your kitchen. Let's say you wanna redo your kitchen and you hire an interior designer. Uh, you know, how much do interior designers charge in this area? Probably 50, 60 bucks an hour. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, you know, probably. But you can get somebody to do that for you. But let's say that you have your heart set on hiring Martha Stewart to redesign your bathroom. Martha Stewart's probably one of the great interior designers in America today. Is how much is she gonna charge to redo your bathroom or your kitchen? Is she gonna charge you 50, 60 bucks an hour? Uh-uh. She's probably gonna charge a lot more than that, all right? But why can she do that? I mean, how can she get away with that? Since all her competition is 50, 60 bucks an hour. The answer is, she's Martha Stewart. You know, she's like, you know, world famous for doing this kind of stuff. When you're buying her to do your, 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 your kitchen, your bathroom, you're not just buying a new kitchen or a new bathroom. You are buying the bragging rights of saying, I had Martha Stewart do this uh, kitchen. This is a, Mar she, you'll probably put a brass plaque on the side of the house. You know, Martha Stewart did the second, you know, bathroom on the second corridor, or the upstairs bathroom. You know, you probably, this would increase the value of your home tremendously. You know, so that's why she could charge a premium price, whatever it is. Uh, I don't even know if she does that kind of work anymore, uh, she's so famous, but, uh, but she, she can justify a premium price because of who she is and because of the extra value that she's providing when she does the job. See, I keep trying to talk my clients into this. I keep telling my clients, you know, my signature on a piece of paper is actually gonna be valuable someday, you know, so I should really charge more for my, my stuff because, you know, I'm a famous lawyer, it doesn't work. Uh, I've, been, I've been trying it for years and just nobody, nobody seems to be buying that argument. I'm not in the same category as, as Martha Stewart, not by, not by a long shot, but someday, someday it'll happen. Anyway, so, so you have to figure in your competition. If you have a value added product or service, you can charge more than your competition and get away with it. One of the very first books that we did, I, I had a publishing company back in the 90s. We used to do career books for lawyers. And one of our very first books that we did was a book on how to interview for a legal job. That, was, that wasn't the title of it, but that was the subject. How to interview as a young lawyer interviewing with a law firm or a government agency, how do you interview for a legal job, okay? Now there were plenty of books out on interviewing at that time, I'm going back about 20 years to early 1990s. Uh, there were plenty of books out there and they were mostly priced in the 12 to $15 range, but they weren't targeting lawyers. Our book was telling lawyers specifically 
how to interview for a legal job. Believe it or not, there was no book in the marketplace at that time. We had the first book in the market to talk, to talk about how to interview for a legal job. So when we did our pricing, we said to ourselves, you know what, we have a value added product here. We do not have to charge 12 to 15 bucks. Lawyers have a lot of disposable income. They will pay mo more money for a book that's targeted to them and their needs. Uh, ultimately, we ended up pricing the book at $50, you know, $49.95, and we ended up being too low. Oh, believe it or not, the book was selling out like hotcakes. We could have easily added another 20, 30 bucks to that price and lawyers still would have bought it, even though the nearest competitor was at $15 a, a, a book. That's what I mean by a value added product or service. But unless you have something like that going on, unless you have some peculiar, unless you can say with a straight face, well, our products and services are light years beyond the competition, that's why we can justify charging more, it's probably not gonna work quite frankly. Uh, although people play the game all the time. Whenever the detergent companies want to increase their prices, what do they put on the box? New and improved, right? The goal here is to say, you're not just getting the same old whatever it is, you're getting something new, something different, something better. That's why we can charge another 10 cents a box for it, okay? Publishers do this all the time, right? Every year, when, when, when they publish a textbook, they don't come out with the same old textbook. What do they do? 36th edition. Never mind, they only changed five words in the entire thousand page book. They can say it's a new edition, you know, and therefore we can justify more money. Everybody plays this game. Uh, we call it the value added game, you know, to try to persuade people that they've got value added products. Most of you are not gonna be able to get away with that. So your competition is gonna be a limit. If everybody else is doing $15 or whatever, you're probably gonna have to do 13 or $14 or whatever to make, a, to make any kind of money, okay? So, so that's revenue, okay? In term, but, but, but another way to raise revenue is also to raise the number of things you sell. Your product may be priced absolutely perfectly, but maybe you're not being aggressive enough in selling it. There may be a huge foreign market for what you're looking to sell, and you're only selling in the United States. You should probably look to sell uh, across international boundaries. Um, or maybe there are different uses for the product that you haven't thought about. You know, so for example, there's a product out there, some of you know it, it's called Arm & Hammer Baking Soda, right? You know, with the hammer and all that stuff. You've seen it, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? What was Arm & Hammer baking soda originally used for when it was first invented? I'll give you a hint. It was called Arm & Hammer baking soda, okay? It was used in baking, you know? And by the way, it's actually coming back in a way. People who are really into organic baking, because it's a 100% natural product, are actually going back uh, to Arm & Hammer baking soda, although it's very tricky. If you've ever tried to bake a cake with Arm & Hammer, just using Arm & Hammer, it's, it's a little tricky. But you can still use it for that. It's very valid. But let's face it, where do you all have a box of Arm & Hammer baking soda? Where in your house? In the refrigerator, exactly, because somebody found out that this stuff kills odors. If you put this in a refrigerator or some other place, it will actually kill odors. So that's the main reason people buy Arm & Hammer baking soda, because some you know, very, you know, uh, very sharp-eyed salesperson saw that people were using it for a different purpose and say, hey, let's sell it like that. You know, I mean, you know, forgive me. I mean, I was in a publishing business for years. You know, I was, uh, you know, I was publishing books, you know, uh, Dead Trees books. <clears throat> the, you know, I mean, if someone told me at that point, you know what, Cliff, I hate to say it, but most of your customers are using your book as a doorstop, you know, to keep the doors open so they don't blow clothes, don't close on a windy day. Well, as the author of the book, I wouldn't really care about that, but as the publisher, I don't care. Okay, well, what that tells me is I gotta remember, remember I talked about being cynical? Well, that tells me that I gotta make it the best darn doorstop I can. Okay, we'll use a thicker paper stock, I'll use a tighter shrink wrap, we'll make this the best darn door, we're in the doorstop business. We didn't know we were in the doorstop business, but that's what we're in, so we're gonna make the best darn doorstops we possibly can. Okay, um, so, so that's the thing. Unless you have a value, so, so figure out new ways to sell your product. Reducing costs. Okay, is the third way that you can hopefully create a gap between revenue and cost and push the time to break even shorter than it is, uh, than it is already. Um, this is tricky, okay? Can, can you ever have a business that has zero cost? Is that possible? A business that doesn't cost anything to start. I mean, you, you see the ads all the time on TV and on the internet. You know, start a business, you know, in your spare time, no cost. I'm sorry, I don't believe any of that. All businesses have costs right? Which tells me that there is a point beyond which you cannot lower your costs, okay? Now, what is that point? Well, it's not as easy as competition, okay? The best way that I can, that I can, that I can explain this concept 
What happens in business when you lower your costs too much? What happens when a company or a business lowers their costs too far? What happens? The quality suffers, exactly right. So when you're looking to set your price, you also want to consider your product quality as well. If you cut your costs too much, your quality will suffer. If an automobile manufacturer starts using plastic instead of metal for certain engine parts, the, 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 the engine will melt over certain temperatures, uh, the engines will blow up and people will get killed. Not a very good thing. No car manufacturer wants that. Uh, I myself, as a lawyer, if I take on too much work, um, my quality of work suffers. I start pulling all-nighters, uh, I get tired, I start making mistakes, and sooner or later I'm gonna get sued for malpractice probably because uh, my quality suffers too. There's only so much work you can take on when you're in a service business. There's only 24 hours in a day and seven days a week. And if you push the envelope too hard, you're gonna start making mistakes in any kind of service business. So even solo service businesses have this issue. Whenever you're planning your revenue and your costs, you have to keep in mind the comp what, what prices the competition is charging. You also gotta factor in at what point below which am I not gonna cut my quality? At what point am I not gonna sacrifice the quality of my product? Uh, at that point, and, and, and those are the parameters, those are, call it the collar, between which all of these things happen. What you're doing here is you're trying to project cash flow, you're trying to project your costs, you're trying to project your revenue, and you're trying to keep a gap between them, which is what you live on, and call it whatever you will. Um, okay, so what I have just taught you in the last five minutes, you may not realize it, is how to manage a company. Whenever you are planning your cash flow for the future, your, your goal is to get your price as high as it can possibly be while still remaining competitive, while still being below your competition, okay, while still pricing below your competition, and keeping your costs as low as they can possibly go without sacrificing your product quality. Those are the two essential goals of every small business. Getting your price as high as it can possibly go while still remaining competitive, getting your costs as low as they can possibly go without uh, sacrificing your product quality can be a challenge and can be very difficult to do sometimes, um, but it must be done. Um, that, is the, that is basically how a small business is, is managed. Um, don't get me wrong, and don't get me wrong, I mean, there are gonna be times you know, when you do this exercise that even despite your best efforts, there will be a month or so in which revenue will not be as sufficient to cover your expenses. You will have bad months. Um, every business is to some extent a little seasonal. Even my business, law practice, um, I, I have bad months too. My bad month every year is August. That's a tough month for me because everybody's on vacation. Nobody's hiring lawyers to do stuff in August. They're all on vacation, they're all out having fun. I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs. Well, actually, I'm not. That's when I do a lot of my writing and all the other stuff that I do. That's why I have it there, is to, is to help me prop me up during the bad months. It's not, it's not a horrible thing to have one or two months a year where expenses exceed revenues. It's okay. The only thing that tells you, though, is that you have to, you have to save money in the good months to cover the, the bad months, that's all. You have to have reserves of cash so that you can pay bills during the months when you know revenue is not going to be coming in. So for example, I can think of one business uh, right off the bat where nine months out of the year, expenses exceed revenues. And it's the toy business, okay, the toy business. When do toy companies make all their money every year? the Christmas and Hanukkah rush, the fourth quarter of the year. During October, November, December, maybe a little bit in January, they do great, but from January to September, Zippo, they got nothing coming in. They got some sales, birthdays and that kind of stuff, but it usually isn't enough to cover their, their big operating expenses. What those companies have to do to survive, they have to make enough during those last three months to cover the rest of their year's operations. And if they can't do that, that's why the toy companies always sweat the, the Christmas and Hanukkah sales. That's why all the newspapers are saying, you know, Christmas sales down this year. That's a disaster th thing for toy companies. You know, if Christmas sales are down, they could have a really, really rough year next year. Uh, companies, ice cream companies, ice cream stores. Do you go out for ice cream three times a week in February? You know, in, in the middle of a raging blizzard, are you gonna go out for an ice cream cone? Well, some people might actually. I, I, I'm one of those people, I like ice cream year round. But most people won't. Most people go for ice cream in the summer months when it's hot. 
right? That's when ice cream companies make their money, spring to early fall, like from maybe March, April to October. The other, I mean, I actually know ice cream stores that close down from October to April. They, they go, the, the owners go south. Uh, they, have, they take their vacation then, because uh, there's, not, there's not enough money to be made. No matter how well you plan, you're always, you're never going to have a such scenario where revenue exceeds expenses every month. You're going to have bad times. Bad economies uh, will drive your sales down, too, to the point. But again, your goals are always the same. Your goals are to keep your prices as high as they can possibly go while still remaining competitive, keeping your costs as low as they can possibly go while still maintaining your product quality. And if you see by doing your cash flow projection that those two objectives are not possible, the only three ways that you can deal with that is to reduce your costs, increase your prices, or increase the number of units that you sell. Those are the, by getting more sales, by finding more uses for the product, more markets for the product, or simply selling more aggressively. This is where your ruthlessness comes out. If your numbers are too thin, for you to live on, or worse, if you're underwater, if your if expenses are exceeding revenues more than a couple of months a year, unless of course you're in a highly seasonal business like the toy business, then you gotta get, this is where your ruthlessness has to kick in. This is where you gotta say, I gotta find new ways, new innovative ways of getting those costs down. I gotta find, is there some country, maybe in sub-Saharan Africa, where I can get labor for $3 an hour? I need $3 an hour for labor to make these numbers work. Is there a country over there where I can, you know, can I can do business, and can I do business over there? Can I find someone who can help me run a factory in whatever that country is? This is how innovation takes place within markets. Somebody wakes up and realizes that the, price, that the money they're making, the revenues aren't high enough, the costs are too high, uh, the revenues are not enough to, to, run the, to, to, to keep the owners a satisfactory means of living, uh, or the costs are too high. That's when most entrepreneurs find their ruthless side and do something very creative to stop that situation from happening. So, just to recap, okay, there are only two places where business comes from for a startup business. It either comes from revenue, in the, uh, from your customers in the form of revenue, or it comes from the owners in the form of capital. One of your primary goals when you're starting up a business is to break even, meaning reach a point where revenue coming in from your customers each month is sufficient to cover your operating expenses each month. That's what break even is. The shorter you can make that time to break even, the, the, the better you will sleep at nights and the easier it will be to attract investors in the future, okay? How do you determine this? By doing a cash flow projection, or we call it an operating budget. First, you project your costs over a period of 12 to 18 months. Really be ruthless here. Find every single cost that is available. Um, consider factoring in your time as, a, as an operating cost, either at minimum wage or whatever somebody else would pay you to do a similar job if you were working for somebody else rather than for yourself. And build in a fudge factor, I recommend 20 to 25% for, for extraneous expenses, miscellaneous, because you will find things. No matter how hard you research your costs, you will find other costs out there once you start in business, and you wanna make sure that you've covered that in your planning. You don't want a $10 increase in one line item knocking, your, knocking you into an unprofitable position. You don't want that. You don't wanna plan it too closely. You wanna leave some, some wiggle room for error. Okay, once you've projected your costs, now you have to project the revenue that will cover those costs. I always suggest begin not by, with prices, begin with sales. How many sales of each product can you reasonably expect each month? Plot that number first, then plug in different prices and see how the numbers affect your profit margin, the difference between your revenue and your costs. If the numbers are too thin, or if you see yourself in a situation where revenues are not covering costs and it's gonna take you forever to break in, well now you have to make some adjustments and there are only three adjustments you can make. You can either increase your price if you can, keeping in mind that you cannot charge more than your competition is charging unless you have a value added product or service, or sell more aggressively, increase the number of sales that you make every month, or both, obviously you can do both. Or the third thing you can do, I mean, if there's no way, if there's no way you can, you, can, you can increase your sales, no way you can increase your prices, then you really gotta get these costs down as much as you can without sacrificing the, your product quality, the quality of the product, the quality of the service that you wanna provide to people. That is basic financial management in a nutshell. As you can see, it's largely a guessing game 
but it's an educated guessing game. Don't be afraid to call competitors and ask them what their prices are. Don't be afraid to look around and see, can something be made cheaper? Than, it, than elsewhere. Don't be afraid to ask these questions. In fact, when you're in business, every day you will be asking these questions. Can I squeeze another 25 cents? Can I raise my prices by another $5 an hour and get away with it without losing too many customers? Uh, can, I, can I cut my price, can I, can, I, can I get my supplier to charge me $25 less per widget, 25 cents less per widget? Um, because I really, need to, I really need that in order to survive. These are the kinds of questions you ask every day and it's ultimately where your ruthlessness as an entrepreneurial business owner kicks in.